I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. My topic tonight, uh, which is finding four refuges in challenging relationships, which you can, of course, apply to challenging situations of just about any kind. So the first is when something happens, uh, whether it's a glitch with Zoom, whether it's being in the middle of a political season, uh, whether it's me earlier today having sent out my Just One Thing newsletter, which goes out to a lot of people. So a lot of people get it and so I get responses. Uh, this one was um, about the practice of voting uh, in all kinds of ways, whether it's at the ballot box or inside our own minds. We vote, we have an opportunity to vote. It's interesting that the root of the word vote is vow, vow. What is our vow expressed through our votes of one kind or another? And some people did not like what I wrote. And right there, I had a chance to oh, deal with a challenge in a relationship. Uh, there may be people in your life that you find challenging in general. You might find yourself suddenly in the middle of an interaction or something has happened that you're stirred up about, understandably, or there's a, a difficulty that must be resolved. Challenges happen, don't they, in our relationships? Uh, they will keep happening <laughs> as long as we have relationships. Uh, you know. So what do we do? I want to offer four refuges, building on the notion of refuge, which is found in many tr traditions throughout the world, many traditions throughout the world. And also, certainly, the notion of refuge is central in Buddhist practice. Uh, it is said that in Buddhist practice, there are three primary refuges, known as the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Those can be understood in different ways. For the Buddha, we have the historical teacher, in whom we have some confidence. And then we have most fundamentally the Buddha nature, the true nature in, in ourselves and by extension in some ultimate sense in everything. Second, there is the Dharma, which means both reality and a useful, accurate description of it, such as found in a collection of teachings. So we can have some confidence in those teachings and find refuge in them. And then last, Sangha, which originally meant the monastics who were sort of the lineage holders in Buddhism. And the notion of Sangha over time has become broadened to really mean community broadly of practitioners on the path. You can extend these ways of looking at it from the Buddhist tradition into other ways of thinking about teachers, teachings, and the community of the taught. More broadly, we can just think about anything that gives us refuge. Uh, outdoors, the sky, wilderness, our cat, uh, drinking water when you're thirsty, uh, looking into the eyes of a friend. These are all refuges of different kinds. A refuge is something that gives us comfort, sanctuary, and support. We refuel at refuges. We recover from stress and challenge and we find reassurance and relief in the refuges in our life. Refuge is really important. And the more challenging or crazy or horrible a person's life is, the more important it is for them to find authentic refuge wherever they can, um, <clears throat> particularly in refuges, of course, that are wholesome. Sometimes we find a little refuge in a glass of wine maybe at a long day, after a long day. Uh, maybe one glass is enough, right? Uh, we don't, you know, sometimes we find refuge in things that uh, have a short-term gain, but long-term pain. So, you know, we want to think about that uh, as well. But that said, refuge is really, really important. So what are your refuges in challenging relationships? When things are difficult, including whether it's 
you know, someone writes you about the current election season in America, or you see something, or you're worried about something, what can we do? The first refuge that I want to suggest to you is the refuge of finding your footing just in the present. You know, if you're outdoors in wilderness, as I've been a lot, and a storm comes through, or you hear a sound like rockfall, or something has happened, you want to stabilize where you are. Find your place. Find your footing. Um, center. Get a sense of your own being. Whatever gives you a sense of immediate stability, find your footing. Really important. Take that breath. Establish a mindfulness around your reactions. Let's suppose that somebody has said something or done something and it sets off a lot of fireworks inside you. Maybe it stirs up material from your past, including your childhood. It's all happening in your mind right there. Step one, get some breathing room. Not to suppress things or to push them away, but to step back from them. Kind of an internal shock absorber or breathing room. That's all about finding your footing most immediately. That's the first thing. That's the first refuge. For me, sometimes it shows up as realizing that this invasive person or this thing that has come at me is not a threat. It's not a life and death threat. If it is, you got to deal with it. But if it's not, recognizing that. Um, recognizing that they are over there and you are here. And in this moment, you are intact. You are intact. You are basically okay. You got a problem to deal with, but in in the present, um, you're not fighting for your life, unless you are, but usually we are not. These are examples of finding your footing. Uh, Tony just wrote into the chat a very important point. When we get triggered, we can get confused by the reaction. It hijacks us. When we find our footing, we um, are distinct from the storm that is sweeping through our minds. Find your footing and claim the right to do that. You might have to step out of a conversation to do that. You might have to hang up the phone. You might have to walk away from your email inbox. You might have to look out the window as I did earlier today. You know, Find your footing. Know what it's like to find your footing on shaky ground, right? It's like you're in the ocean or uh, the winds are blowing. You're rattled. Whew. Find your footing. Maybe you're driving and it's starting to rain really hard. You pull over to the side of the road. You find your footing. Stabilize. Secure a base of operations. That's first. Second, <clears throat> find the facts. That's the second key refuge in challenging relationships. And let's be clear, there are facts. I am here. <laughs> That's a fact. You are here. That's a fact. Uh, <clears throat> this is a bottle of water I reuse, but it's a fact. Find the facts that are relevant. And... Uh, I want to give you a few down-to-earth examples. Um, early on, when my wife and I had children, first when we began having, to, when we had our first, when we had our first, and then our second children, um, we had a lot of work to do, and we had to figure out how to share it. How do you share childcare, housework, making money? Uh, we, we had different tasks we needed to fulfill. It really helped us to kind of find the facts of how we were using our time. 
what she was doing, what I was doing, you know, when the baby needed to be walked at night, uh, when they, when he needed to be fed. What are the facts? And interestingly, in most couples, certainly in the West, in the Western countries of the world, uh, let's let's say heterosexual couples, uh, to kind of simplify the, the case here. Typically, the woman, the mother, when children arrive, is on task one way or another about 15 to 20 hours a week more than her male partner is, whether or not she's drawing a paycheck. This is a very robust finding in the research that was true 25 or so years ago when I pulled together the original research for my first book, Mother Nurture, and is true today as we're pulling together the research for a revised uh, version of it that'll come out in, a, in a, probably a couple years. So, um, you know, those are facts. And when I've worked with couples and I get them to do uh, uh, a accurate estimate, roughly, of how they are each spending their time during the 168 hours of the week, it's dramatic when they find those facts. And as research shows, again, in heterosexual couples after kids come along, the man is typically doing more than his female partner thinks he's doing, and he is typically doing much less than he thinks he is doing, on average, on average. And for every exception to that generalization, and I, my wife would count me among those exceptions, you may well be among those exceptions um, here tonight, that means that there are other families in which those inequities are even greater than the average. So finding those kind of facts is really helpful. What are the facts? If um, you are trying to sort out an issue with someone at work about their role in yours, what are the relevant facts? Who is doing what? What are the important results to accomplish? Who is accomplishing them? At what pace are they being accomplished? Are you going to run out of money in your business before they get accomplished? These are relevant facts. You know? And it's okay that, um, you know, that the facts keep cha can change. It's okay that our descriptions of the facts are situated in a postmodern sense in our culture. But at the end of the day, facts are facts. Was the light red or green when you drove through it? Um, you know, when you look out at society also, there's this common notion in this time of massive disinformation, motivated disinformation. There's this kind of notion that, um, you know, that you cannot find the truth. Actually, in five or 10 minutes online, it's pretty easy to find out the basic facts. You know, who's getting richer? Who's getting poorer? Is the planet getting hotter? Are the glaciers melting? Um, who is making it easier to vote? Who is making it harder to vote? These are fairly discernible um, facts. And uh, yeah, it's important also to be clear about what are the sources of factual information. For me, credible sources of factual information uh, update their information when they are shown to be in error. And credible sources of information compete with other credible sources of information around accuracy. For example, university institutes compete with each other to be make sure that they are um, finding and presenting accurate information. Uh, major nonprofit organizations you know, that are committed to factual information are also very good sources. Major news organizations that update their versions of things uh, when new factual information comes in, they're not perfect. I'm not trying to say that they're perfect, but their credibility is higher than purported sources of factual information that do not admit mistakes. 
and do not correct their mistakes in clear and public ways. Those are much less credible sources of factual information. You can still have your own values. You can still have your own interpretation of the facts, your own perspective on the facts. But at the end of the day, um, there are facts and there are highly credible sources uh, uh, who can help to identify facts, including the facts of your own two eyes. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also helpful when we look for facts to uh, ask ourselves, are we prepared to change our frame of reference and our point of view to new factual information? The great uh, early psychologist, psychiatrist, uh, Jean Piaget, um, pointed out that there were two ways that children learned, and we can apply those to ourselves today. Uh, we can learn through uh, assimilating existing information, pardon me, new information into an existing framework. That's a very efficient way to do it. More challenging cognitively is to accommodate our perspectives to new information that forces us to change our perspectives at least a little bit. We accommodate our perspectives to the new information. And um, it's really important to ask yourself, are you prepared to accommodate, to update your view of another person? I've worked with many couples in which, uh, understandably, they walk into my office and there's a plaintiff and a defendant. <laughs> there is someone who has complaints, usually quite justified, about their partner. They might be fairly small, but uh, chronic aggravations, or they might be so serious that they're looking at a divorce or a, serious, a breakup in their relationship, plaintiff, defendant. Very often, <laughs> not always, the defendant, maybe grudgingly at first, gets the seriousness here and realizes, okay, there is, a, there is a lot of validity in the requests or the unmet needs or the criticisms or the grievances or the complaints that the plaintiff has. And the defendant starts trying to do better. And I hope my terms are not offending you. I hope you can understand what I'm saying. Um, so here we have the person who's received the request, received the complaint, let's say, heard the grievance, and is trying to do better in a sincere way, not just to get me off their back, <laughs> but in a sincere way, they are trying to do better. And sometimes what will happen is that they will be doing better in my office with the plaintiff, the person who dragged them into couples counseling in the first place, with the plaintiff watching but the plaintiff is so committed to their grievance and their criticism that they do not even see that their partner, potentially the person they walked back down the wedding aisle next to, that their partner is truly trying to do better. The plaintiff cannot update their priors in the language of Nate Silver and Bayesian analysis. The plaintiff cannot accommodate their view of their other person um, to the evidence right before their eyes that they are trying harder. And that's, and that's problematic. So um, that's the second finding. Find the facts as you see them. You decide what they are. Others may disagree with you. You may, your version of the facts may disagree from my version of the facts, okay? Uh, but at least find the facts. That's the second refuge, to see clearly. The third refuge is to find what you care about. What do you care about? What's your priority, right? Um, for example, in my situation, uh, I could have gotten into a big argument with the people who emailed me today about the newsletter I sent out. I could have done that. Um, you know, uh, earlier today, I was talking with my wife about the famous example of driving and do I drive too fast and da-da-da-da-da. 
And in any of these situations, it's so helpful to find what you care about. What do you care about? What's your real priority? Is your priority, you know, pursuing the bait of, um, you know, what the other person is tossing your way to try to hook you into an argument because they want to get into an argument? Maybe that's their way of relating to others. Uh, you know, in terms of, uh, as you see the facts, maybe you discover a fact that's important about your own health care. And you realize, I need to really care about that. I was talking with someone earlier today who's a very, very capable, um, generous, competent uh, person who has terrible self-worth. In her reality, she is a colossal failure. It's totally wrong. It's not true. And our conversation earlier today was about, in a sense, helping her start to really care about this thing she is seeing inside herself and to care enough about it to seriously challenge it once and for all, once and for all. So find what you care about in a relationship issue, right? So often we're in these situations and we realize that we are winning the battle but losing the war, you know? I am sometimes in situations where something is happening that I think is a little misguided maybe in my company or in projects I'm doing with other people. And I have to be careful about a certain exasperated, all-knowing tone that can slip in. Gee, I wonder where that came from. And it can slip in. And I have to ask myself, what do I care about here? Do I care about showing them that I'm smarter or that I'm righter? Or that do I care about proving that they're wrong? Or do I just simply care about that the next time they will do things differently? Or do I care about keeping the peace you know, in this relationship? Or maybe do I care about having this person feel encouraged and valued as part of our team or project more than getting them to realize that they made a little mistake in this one little area off to the side? What do you care about most? And reserving the right to decide for yourself what you care about most, I find incredibly important, especially for people who belong to groups, like frankly, girls and women, and there are other groups as well, who have had what they care about shamed or punished or dismissed or pushed to the margins. So it's, it's really important if you're someone who has been told again and again that you care about the wrong things or what you care about does not matter as much as what other people care about. If you're that kind of person and you've internalized that, understandably, it's especially important for you to stand up for yourself inside your own mind that you have the right, you have the right to decide what you care about. Is this clear? I found this one to be really, really useful. It really helps to find your footing and find the facts and then decide what you care about. <laughs> I try to care about, you know, there's a saying, the most important thing is to remember the most important thing. I try to remember and um, care about the teaching of the Buddha that wisdom is choosing a greater happiness over a lesser one right? Our reactive brains with the negativity bias and the ways we've learned and been trained by our childhood and then the life that followed, we, we often reflexively, automatically, rigidly sometimes care about certain things uh, that are not good for us and others. And it really helps to find your footing, which often means pausing, 
initially, and then truly discerning the facts with clarity, not jumping off the deep end, not jumping into the deep end based on faulty assumptions, but to slowing down to try to see clearly. Then you often realize that what your lizard brain, as it were, reflexively cared about is not in your best interest or the best interest of other people. And you then can help yourself shift from that old habit of prioritizing things into a wiser, longer-term prioritization of what you truly most care about. Really important. And then last, find your path from here. Wherever here is, what are you going to do? Are you just going to let, as, as that I did earlier today, those emails go by and reply in a simple, respectful way without getting into a big argument? With, let's say, someone who is um, bringing a criticism to you that's kind of a mess. <laughs> It's got a lot woven into it, including some exaggerations of what has happened and maybe a certain amount of tone, maybe about your driving or something else. Maybe your path forward is to kind of sort through it, whether or not you talk about that sorting, but to sort through it to the part that is valid or that is the priority, like the other person feeling happy and safe and relaxed when they're with you or when they're working with you. And then based on that clarity of what you care about, you make your path forward to respond to that and to make an agreement, how you will be next time or what we will do next time in our family or in our workplace or as neighbors, how you will agree to respond in the future. Find your path. It's so helpful to know, what are you going to do? The next time you meet with that doctor, what are you going to do? Um, the next time your brother-in-law sends you a crazy thing on Facebook, what are you going to do? Are you going to let it go by? Are you going to disengage from that person? Are you going to politely assert a principle that you think is important? Right? What are you going to do based on what you care about? Sometimes what we care about is that it's, we're just not going to let something go by. We're just not going to let an assertion of fact go by that's wildly inaccurate. And, you know, I'm, I'm here to tell you Donald Trump lost the election in 2020. Fair is fair. Even, you know, <laughs> leading members of his own party, including Mitch McConnell, acknowledge that. That's a fact. Maybe you choose not to assert it as you find your path forward, or maybe you choose to assert it. You know, right now, worldwide, on average, about 10,000 children a day die of hunger. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that crazy? That's a fact. And it may be appropriate in your path forward to assert a fact like that, to assert a fact that roughly one in five just a little less, but close to one in five children in America today live below the poverty line. Roughly a million children in America go homeless every year. Yeah. Those are facts. And maybe you'll decide in your path forward that it's appropriate to name them. Or simpler facts, like with a roommate who keeps saying they will clean their shelf in the refrigerator but doesn't. You decide your path forward is to be firm about that. Um, I have been involved in an organization um, that's starting, and I had to assert myself in the path forward because we were going way off course. Maybe that's your path forward. So sometimes your path forward may be to just let it go by. Other times your path forward is to assert yourself. In future talks, I will explore more how to assert ourselves skillfully with an open heart as it's appropriate with other people. I'm not excluding that as part of the path forward. I'm just saying, whatever it is, know what your path is. What's your plan? 
What's your plan? Whatever it might be, you know, with that other person. What's your plan for um, trying to find a rapprochement with a challenging person? What's your plan? And your plan is involved with what you can do, what actually you have power over or control over or influence over. What's your plan? Know your plan. It's such a refuge, you know. I've been in wilderness situations where my plan was to survive till sunrise. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Maybe that's your plan. Maybe your plan is to, as they say sometimes, embrace the suck. You know, you just have to get through it. It's terrible. You have a course of treatment. I have a dear friend who just came through the other side of uh, treatment for a serious throat cancer. You know, knock, knock on wood, he's still cancer free. His plan was to go through hell for four months, which he did, and he's now on the other side. Maybe that's your plan. Know what your plan is. Maybe your plan is that you're kind of done with someone. You're just going to avoid intersections between yourself and them, you know, in the future. Uh, what, what's your plan? It's really great to know what your plan is. Okay. So these are the four that I want to offer to you. We need refuges. We're fragile. Life is changing. Often the center falls apart. Many people, including myself, are deeply concerned about the state of the world, including the world in our own country. While I am, and many people are also seeing many opportunities and many resources that we can draw upon. We live in times of unprecedented peril and unparalleled promise. Which way will we tip? We're, we are all in the middle of finding out. So whether your concerns about relationships are at that scale or in the immediate scale of your adult children, or your aging parents, your neighbor, your partner, your friend. In all these situations, we need to find refuges, places that restore us and repair us and, and refuel us. And for me, there are clearly four key refuges in our relationships. Finding your footing, finding the facts, finding what you care about, and finding your path forward, whatever it might be from there. So I'm going to take a peek at the chats to see if there's some questions or comments that uh, I want to respond to. And um, let's see here. That's good. Okay. Great. Aha. Does someone have a specific question related to what we've talked about tonight that they want to put in the chat? I'll take a quick peek in a second, and maybe we'll have a chance to talk with someone. Uh, you can raise your hand. You go to the reactions button the bottom of the Zoom window, tap that button, and um, uh, you'll pop to the front of the group. Um, I am definitely going to end on time tonight at half past the hour, 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, probably because one of the facts is that I've been burning the candle at all ends, including the middle, over the last um, weeks, and uh, I, I kind of need a little refuge myself. So bear with me here. Okay, great. So Claudia, I see you there. and. <clears throat> Great. I'm going to speak to Esther's question that has come in 21 minutes past the hour, then hopefully there's time for you, Claudia. Okay? So Esther asked a question. Can you elaborate more on how to find our footing when we are really emotionally triggered? That question is right in my wheelhouse. <laughs> it's a longtime psychologist and a meditation teacher. Um, great. So the first, notice you're triggered. Right there, uh, I am triggered. And right there is kind of half the process, right there of finding your footing. And there's a lot of research that shows that even naming to yourself what you're feeling, 
triggered, frozen. As soon as you name that you're frozen, you start unfreezing. Notice you're triggered. Second, take a breath and notice that you're breathing. Undeniable fact, breathing. When we're triggered, we tend to stop breathing or breathe shallowly, shallowly, lightly. Um, take a deliberate breath. That tends to break up the frozenness of the trigger pattern, which is physiological too. It's in your body. Deliberately take a breath. Okay? Notice you're triggered. Deliberately take a breath. Third, widen your view. If only for a, a in the the initial few seconds, look a, look around the room, lift your gaze up, get a sense of the bigger picture, be aware of your body as a whole. Neurologically, that's like a circuit breaker that pulls you out of the trigger reaction. Uh, it activates networks on the sides of your brain, right hemisphere for right-handed people, etc. Widens the view. Really important. Fourth thing you can do when you're triggered, and this is psychological first aid, and this is all evidence-based. This is rock solid, mental first aid. <laughs> um, find something that is physically pleasurable in the simple moment. It might be the feeling of breathing. It might be a, a sense of putting your hand on your heart. A anything, something that is a moment of physical pleasure. You know, warming your hands in hot water, in warm water, um, eating something that you like to eat, a little bit of tea, whatever. Look out, find something beautiful, flower, pleasure, especially healthy pleasure, reduces the trigger. Last, look for a relationship or a sense of connection Think of people who, who do care about you. Find a sense yourself of caring about others. We are so, social primates. When we're triggered, it is so important to find connection with others that feels right to you. Sometimes other people are the trigger. So it's really helpful to find those who are not triggering you or to find a sense of relatedness maybe in nature or to pull to mind people that have been supportive for you in your past. These are all different things you can do, but it's basically to try to find some basic, undeniable, healthy sense of connection of some kind, okay? These all help us find our footing. There are other things. You might have other things that really help you. Um, I look out, I see the trees that were here before I was born and they will be here after I've died. Um, I look at the sky, I think of the stars, you know. I'm a science geek, so I think of the universe altogether. <laughs> that calms me down, helps me find, helps me put things in perspective. Whatever works for you. Music, whatever works for you. Poetry, whatever works for you. Okay, these are things that can help you find your footing when you're triggered. Okay. So Thank, so now, Claudia, I'm going to ask you to unmute. You okay there, Claudia? I'm asking you to unmute now. And keep this succinct, please, and make it relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, basically, I just wanted to add a little bit to what you have said, because it's. I took a course uh, uh, with Eve Ekman that I'm sure you know. Oh, great. Eve yeah, Ekman. Yeah. Yes. Right, Ekman. right, yes. right. Cultivating emotional balance and... Yeah. Uh, when noticing the triggers, and I've had I've had to do a lot of work with anger, yeah. also feeling, getting to recognize that trigger in my body, and also me meditation, uh, and feeling those destructive emotions, but like really feeling them, and and trying to figure out after sorting out the the facts, like you said, trying to figure out what are my needs what really are my, my needs and where do these triggers come from? Sometimes from childhood, yeah. yeah. And then coming, like you said, step back, but then coming back and negotiating sort of like, this is what I need. Sure, right? that's great, so, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, so 
Very oh, good. that's great to focus on what you really need, which right. goes to what I said, the, the third, I think, find, find what you care about. Right. And sometimes yeah. I've had to be vulnerable and say to the person, look, this triggers this because of my background, whatever. Yeah. And that's how I, why I feel this way. And this is what I need from yeah. you or whatever. So anyway. Oh, thank you for offering that. Oh, no, it's great. That's great. Um, well, thank you very much, Claudia. This is what I need. And uh, to me, it's really central and interesting in the Buddhist teachings about craving. A lot of people who have a Buddhist practice do not think enough about craving. <laughs> you know, they just go, oh, craving, you know, it's a, like a platitude or a cliche, but well, why do we crave? We crave because we're, we're biologically, craving is biological. Really let that sink in. Like, why do we breathe? Well, we breathe because you know we need the oxygen and we get through you know breathing for our metabolic processes. We are aerobic creatures, not anaerobic. Um, no, craving is much the same. It's biological. Why do lizards crave in their way? You know, um, because needs are unmet. When our needs are met, craving falls away. There can still be habits of craving that are um, still with us. And we can remind ourselves again and again uh, that we actually have enough in the moment. And to notice also that we can pursue our goals without craving. Wow. We can protect ourselves and others without hatred or fear. We can do it with calm strength, right? We can pursue um, justice and we can work to change the incentives inside and outside forces of concentrated wealth and power without hating anyone, without letting the poison of hatred invade our heart. We can do these things. Yeah, that's amazing, isn't it? It's remarkable to realize that we can function, we can succeed, we can be ambitious. <laughs> we can organize a weekly meditation group with hundreds of people without doing it in a contracted, driven, craving way that makes us suffer. Wow. Wow. Really amazing, isn't it? Okay. So... Let's start to finish up. I'm glad you hung in there, right? Uh, with all the events and the turbulence of tonight. And it's really helpful to keep appreciating that whether it's the you know difficulty with setting up the Zoom meeting and we will send you a good link and for next week and so forth, um, or just the stuff that's coming through the chat. You know, at the end of the day, find your footing, right? Find the facts. Find what you care about, your priorities, the, the greater happiness for you, and find your path forward. Know what your path is, which might be uh, pausing until you see a path, but that is your path, at least. These are four refuges that we can find right in the middle of challenging relationships. <laughs>